Greetings and welcome to the Tuesday edition. I'm News Talk Radio's John Gormley, and thanks for checking in here wherever you have decided to find us on this day. So maybe this is the week or part of your summer vacation. Well, I'm so glad that you've included us in your busy day. Maybe you're just back from a couple of weeks of vacation. Well, stand by a busy session ahead here today. Open lines, which usually runs in the 9 to 10 hour, deferred by an hour today because of a very special guest. The regular Ask the Premier segment, Premier Brad Wall joins us for the next hour on the business of our Saskatchewan. Any questions you have to ask of the Premier, or you may want to pass them along, texting 306-306, Twitter at John Gormley Live, same coordinates on Facebook, or John Gormley Live at Rolco.com if you want to drop us a note via email. This is... Ask the Premier. Let's now head to Swift Current, Saskatchewan, where we uh, check in with Premier Brad Wall. Premier, thanks for taking our call. Hi, John. Um, you and I spoke uh, briefly last week, the uh, uh, Council of Federation, the Premier's meeting, what's been going on on energy. Uh, just let's start with that today. The whole Christy Clark, B.C., uh, Allison Redford, Brad Wall, kind of Saskatchewan, Alberta take. What is happening with B.C. on this Northern Gateway Pipeline? Well, they haven't changed their position. Their position uh, is uh, they have five conditions for their approval of or their support for the uh, uh, for the Gateway Pipeline. They don't have an official standing in the process, the provincial government of BC, but obviously their approval is pretty important. And uh, the fifth the fifth condition is problematic. The fifth condition requires that Alberta share some of its royalties. Uh, you know, our position has been: look, we understand the people of British Columbia will want to maximize uh, the benefit from any project through their province. They'll also want to mitigate environmental risks. It's our view, though, that the source for that mitigation and the source for that benefit sharing is not the people of Alberta or the people of Saskatchewan's royalties, but rather uh, perhaps what the companies can uh, can provide in addition to what they've already proposed. Uh, and that's our position, and I think it's also Alberta's. So this the situation hasn't changed, and I think it's problematic because though BC doesn't have a role to, uh, for example, directly reject the pipeline, Obviously, B.C. owns their hydro, their own power company, much as Saskatchewan does. And they've indicated, look, they would withhold power from a pipeline. They've indicated they could sort of grind the process in terms of permitting to a, to a real ebb, to, a, to, uh, to slow it down and, uh, and drag it out. So this is a concern. We've got to be able to get our, our goods to market. Canada's in a great spot right now because in Western Canada, we have very much what the fastest-growing economies of the world want, and that's food security and energy security. But we ought to be able. We, we need to get there from here. We have to get our goods to market, and um, constitutionally, the country's set up to facilitate that. So this is this is problematic. Premier Brad Wall with us. This is Ask the Premier. Lines are lighting up at one eight seven seven three three two eight two five five. Your questions to the Premier. Uh, Premier also on the uh, top of the checklist of uh, of items. Uh, the first quarter financial report released Friday by the uh, Deputy Premier, the Minister of Finance, uh, Ken Kravetz. Uh, we've been looking at particularly the, the price of oil having been below that $100 a barrel, which the province had predicated the estimates on for this year for revenue. Uh, where do we find ourselves one quarter into the, the, the new fiscal year, financial year? Well, overall, our revenue is forecast to be down about $113 million from budget. That's largely due to oil, which is off $159 million, and also land sales. Of course, oil companies bid for the right to uh, rather uh, assemble the land, lease the land from the people of Saskatchewan to drill and explore for oil, and those numbers are down as well. So uh, when you add in some increases in revenue, though, in terms of corporate income tax and some other things, it nets out at being $113 million down. So... Uh, what we're doing is uh, we're we're going to watch our expenses. We've asked ministries to look for about a half a percent uh, of savings, and uh, because of the other revenue increases we see, we still have a balanced budget. We have a surplus of $12 million, uh, and there are still $714 million, and that's cash. It's not an accounting entry in, in the growth and financial uh, uh, security fund. So, uh, I mean, we're obviously in an enviable position when you consider every other jurisdiction in the country that has a deficit. But it's tighter, certainly, than it is now. It's something we're watching. Interestingly, John, I, on the day the first quarter was released by the Minister of Finance last, well, last Friday, oil jumped four, four and a half bucks that day. So it's very volatile. We see that. We know it. 
uh, and it's going to move up and down. And right now we're in a balanced position, but we're watching things very carefully. Part of the Saskatchewan advantage is a balanced budget, fiscal responsibility, and we're going to be careful to maintain that advantage. Now, do we, uh, one quarter into the year, uh, recalibrate what the estimate is, or do we stay with that $100 barrel oil? No, we reduce the uh, estimates down through the quarters or move them up, as the case may be. And uh, so I think right now we're, we've pegged that $90 uh, uh, as a general area to be in for now. That might move up again with the quarters. That's what governments have done in Saskatchewan, well, for a very long time. We do the same thing with potash and uh, and, the, and the dollar, because as you know, the dollar affects us. We sell, effectively, we export in U.S. dollars, and so... Uh, when our dollar is at par or ahead, we're also in a, in a tougher position from a revenue standpoint. And when the price of oil goes down, typically the dollar goes down. So that's also providing some balance, some counterweight to the decrease in revenue uh, uh, attributed to oil prices declining. Premier Brad Wall with us. This is Ask the Premier, our summer edition. Uh, okay, you always, uh, based on your monthly visit with us, uh, take a couple of uh, listener calls away where um, you're going to do a little bit of further work. Uh, what do you have on uh, unfinished business from our last session? We had a couple, John. We had a question around would uh, the health region, would the health system use fluorescent needles for the needle exchange program, which every province has. Uh, and I am told the Ministry of Health has actually looked at this, uh, looked at research on colored syringes, and uh, there's not clear evidence that this reduces accidental sharing uh, or would have the intended benefit. So there's no intention to head in that direction. We have a return rate of 94%. Obviously, uh, the 6% is still too much, uh, and we see that in the spring in our major cities. Uh, and you've, you've uh, chronicled that as well in your show, John, but we're not moving to those uh, to those colored syringes as the, as the caller had asked. Uh, because uh, the evidence doesn't show they they, they provide the, the help that would be wanted. Uh, second question was on the specialty wine and liquor store situated situation in Saskatoon with CAVA closing down. Uh, I can tell you this, that uh, sometime this fall we'll be making an announcement about uh, the next step, That probably a, an additional store, a new store with a very transparent public process. In the meantime, the receiver for this particular uh, franchise has uh, he's facilitated the sale of the of the store of the current store the the one that just closed of their inventory to another liquor permittee and Saskatchewan customers who can purchase the uh, specialty products that Cava had through this through this other permit holder that uh, already exists. Okay. Um, yeah, so this fall, there will be word on a, an expansion of existing retailing of liquor in Saskatoon. Well, this fall will be an announcement of the replacement for CAVA. Okay. So what's the long-term solution? Right now, we just have a, there's a temporary solution in place that the receiver has facilitated by moving the, the inventory that was there to another, uh, to another store and customers can access it. But that's not the long-term solution. We need to revisit a store. The one in, in Regina is working well and notwithstanding some pretty serious problems that are also well documented. We, uh, we want to continue to be able to offer that in the, in the largest city of Saskatoon. Premier Brad Wall with us. Now, let me bring you back to the colored syringes. Um, uh, public health officials, you know, uh, you, clearly if the, if the question that's being asked is, does this reduce needle sharing? Of course, the answer is no, it doesn't. Um, public health officials are very reluctant to do this because what police and public safety officials want to be able to do is determine when that 6% of needles are found discarded. It's been a common practice of the health regions to argue, well, they're not really our needles. You know, I, I recently encountered this in Saskatoon. Somebody said, well, uh, guys will go to drug stores, you know, white-collar drug users, and buy so-called bags of rigs. So, gosh, we have no way of knowing if these are health region needles. Those of us who have argued for this have said, if you had a colored type of needle, then when thousands of these syringes are found in alleys and on streets and boulevards, although albeit only 6%, but it's thousands, we'd be able to say, hey, this didn't come from a private sale drug store. This came courtesy of the health region. Now, was that question canvassed? Uh, I'm not sure because, you know, and, and John, my response to that would be notwithstanding what public health officials are saying, you, uh, you won't hear or you shouldn't hear that argument from elected people. Uh, we know that they're out there. We know that obviously the great preponderance of these needles in the spring are coming from the, the public exchange. We've taken steps to try to actually reduce the number of exchange needles with more intervention, more education at the point of contact. This is a concern for us, and it has been since we were first elected. Uh, and so we're looking at a number of ways to deal with it. But 
and I, I, I'm not going to speak for uh, uh, health officials uh, at the local level, but I will say provincially, you won't hear uh, the provincial government elected officials, or you shouldn't, saying, well, you know, we don't really know whose they are. Uh, you know, let's face it, there's a public exchange program. Six percent of them aren't coming back, and there's every likelihood that the great number of them, or the great majority of them, are, are from the public system. Premier Brad Wall with us. Callers, stand by. This is Ask the Premier, our monthly session where you put your question to Premier Wall. Stand by, callers. Some good questions coming in. You're next at one 332 8255 This is News Talk Radio. I'm John Gormley. Premier Brad Wall is here. We call this Ask the Premier. It's your regular session where any questions at one 332 8255 or through uh, social media, texting, uh, you name it, uh, questions are yours. Uh, okay, let's go first of all to uh, Twitter. Premier Brad Wall joining us on the phone. Uh, Premier, one of our gang on Twitter says... Will the province move to ban 15 passenger vans for public school use? Uh, and this came, comes up uh, apropos of the U.S. And, of course, uh, I think it was that terrible bus. Uh, you remember the van crash? Right. right. Uh, I think it was New Brunswick several years ago. Um, is this something that's uh, under consideration in the, 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 the transport area? It's not under active consideration, John. Uh, I mean, notwithstanding what was a horrific accident uh, in Atlantic Canada that everybody remembers well and... Uh, uh, I think it has uh, a lot of uh, individual schools making decisions, different decisions perhaps, and what they rent for for some school trips. But no, uh, to be direct and to the uh, to the question on Twitter, no, we're not. Uh, we have no plans for banning those kinds of units uh, for school transport purposes. And that's a question from uh, Allison, uh, who asked that question. One eight seven seven three three two eight two five five. Uh, the other issue that's been getting a fair bit of traction in some circles, uh, the labor consultation piece on uh, changing different labor statutes or consolidating uh, all of them into one big statute. Uh, the consultation started early May. The period expired uh, at the end of July. Where is that at the present time? I think you might remember, John, when this was announced, we had the NDP in the end organized labor saying that no one would, <clears throat> no one's going to have time to participate in this thing, uh, that 90 days wasn't enough. A couple points. One, that's the period for 90 days to the to July 31st, as you've highlighted, was the, was the time period for formal submissions. Now we have them, and now government can make a decision in terms of going forward with changes or not going forward with some changes. Then a legislation would be introduced in the fall if we decide to go ahead uh, with some. And then it's not passed, of course, until the spring sitting. So you have all that period of time, like you do with every single bill, every single piece of legislation for public input and consultation. 3,800 submissions have been received by the government. Uh, they, were, they came in in time by July 31st. Uh, many, many strongly supporting what was proposed, some of the changes. Many uh, not, uh, not supporting them and some offering other ideas. Uh, so we're very pleased with the response, and we're going to look through the information very carefully uh, and, again, uh, make a decision as to whether additional legislation is required to modernize the labor environment to keep that right balance that we want to strike always between uh, between both sides in the labor equation uh, while being competitive economically, and we'll make the decision if there is to be introdu- legislation as a result of these uh, of this process, we'll introduce it the fall, and then people will have a chance to look at it and provide feedback back to government before it's passed in the spring. Premier Brad Wall is with us. This is Ask the Premier. Kathy and Prince Albert, you're on with Premier Wall. Good morning, Brad Wall. Good morning. Um, yes, um, they want to change the um, the rental supplement thing. Um, they're looking, I think you guys were looking into about uh, and shows of service changing the the uh, income for like for rental, like for people on rental income. No, this this is a, if somebody's on social assistance, Kathy. Yes, and they want to change it because the uh, rent is so high, and uh, and I was told that uh, they won't, the government's looking into about changing it for certain people because uh, the rent's so high in Saskatchewan and you can't find affordable rent. Right. Well, thank, thanks for the call. A couple things. Early on in our first term, uh, we took steps to significantly increase the housing supplement. 
the rental housing supplement for people who needed that help on social assistance who were who who in need of some sort of assistance. In fact, we took the, uh, the I think, an unprecedented step, certainly for the province, and I believe we were first in the country to actually start indexing this allowance. And we did it by region, because some regions of the province, Saskatoon is a good example, Estevan to be a good example, you have an even tighter housing market, and the inflation there is even greater. And so we wanted to index to inflation those supplements, and we've taken that step. Recently, we've also done a real a survey of government of government owned housing, and we've determined that since there's been no uh, changes and certainly not a lot of oversight over the over the many 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 years of uh, this program's existence, we have people who are in social housing whose incomes are significantly higher than what you would might think of as uh, as those needing that public housing. There are fi- this isn't a large number, but it, it underscores the point. Fifteen tenants, in fact, in social housing with incomes over $100,000 a year. And that goes down from that, but a significant number. So we are going to look at that carefully and make sure that we have social housing for those who need it the most. Uh, anybody who's currently, any existing tenant who's paying below about 320 it's actually 314 a month, sorry, they're going to be, uh, they're the most vulnerable, obviously. They deserve that consideration, and uh, they're going to be uh, locked in. We're not making changes there, but we are trying to avail, uh, free up as much social housing as we can to people who actually need it uh, and update uh, uh, our records in terms of who's uh, who's occupying those particular dwellings in Saskatchewan. So those are a couple of, those might be what the caller's uh, talking about, John, that last piece. Uh, that's what the government's uh, pursuing. Premier Brad Wallace here. This is Ask the Premier, regular monthly installment where the Premier takes your calls. Ron in Lestock, Saskatchewan. You're on with Premier Wall. Yeah. I noticed the uh, government, uh, the federal government is getting rid of severance packages for uh, government workers at quite an expense, actually, and uh, wondering if we could count on the provincial government to do, do the same to get rid of the severance packages. I'm not sure how that uh, is. I'm not sure uh, to which the caller is referring, John, because um, I, that's the first I've heard. I mean, this is a this is a matter of courts uh, of uh, of precedent set court cases, frankly, uh, in terms of. Uh, yeah, I think I think Ron, um, and again, I, I'm not going to fill in the blanks for him, but I think what Ron's referring to is there was a a provision in the Public Service Alliance of Canada agreement where even where people kept their jobs, they would still end up with severance under certain circumstances. And the feds, you know, moved to do a cash payout to basically, you know, pay out and, and remove everybody's right. Uh, the feds have not taken away the right to severance because, okay. of course, in collective so, agreements and in employment law, if you let somebody go, you owe them payment in lieu of notice. Right. And uh, we're obviously uh, we're obviously subject to that. And we are making changes right now. You know, John, we're in the middle of a process. Uh, it's called workforce adjustment, where we're reducing the size of government by 15% in four years. We're about halfway through and on track to do it by uh, using, through attrition, uh, through lean management techniques, getting government more efficient. Obviously, we don't want frontline service to be sacrificed, but we're finding uh, some savings there. And uh, uh, more recently, we've seen some mergers of some ministries, uh, for example, the Ministry of the Economy. And sure, there's, uh, we, we indicated that there'll be some efficiencies, uh, a reduction in the number of uh, people there, and that's been the case. But Anyone who's eligible for severance certainly will, will get severance. Hang on, Mr. Premier. Brad Wall is with us. This is Ask the Premier. I'm John Gormley, only on News Talk Radio. I'm John Gormley. Welcome back. This is our first day back after the August long, and I am delighted you're with us today. Premier Brad Wall is here, our regular monthly session of what we call Ask the Premier. Premier Wall and you at 1-877-332-8255. Anything on your mind at all? We talk uh, Saskatchewan uh, economy. We talk about different government decisions you're following, things you want an answer on from your Premier. It all goes here on Ask the Premier. Let's get back now to uh, Premier Brad Wall and Jeff in Kinley, Saskatchewan. Jeff, you're on with the Premier. Hey, Premier Bravo. I want to say good job so far. Um, question. I'm in favor of uh, business, and I want there to be at least an option of different vehicle insurance, as I personally think that we should have the option to go elsewhere. If SGI is so good at what they do, then, you know, there's nothing to be scared of. But at least let us have the option to go elsewhere if we want. 
Thanks uh, for the call, Jeff. We uh, campaigned pretty clearly on a position of not uh, removing the privatizing or removing the monopoly that SGI has on basic auto insurance. So uh, we wouldn't break that promise. And I, I would say that uh, if you take a look at the numbers, uh, SGI, there's a couple of other provinces that, that, uh, uh, that rank well, and they also have a government insurance uh, company, ICBC in British Columbia and then Manitoba. And uh, from a basic auto insurance perspective, we, we compare favorably. Of course, there's a lot of competition, and there should be in any package policies, and you can deal with a lot of different companies to get that. But we were pretty clear in the campaign about a promise, uh, and we've been working very hard as a government both to uh, to do the things that we said we would do, but also to not do the things that we said we wouldn't do. And uh, this would fall into the latter category. Premier Brad Wall with a stadium update, Premier, since we last spoke uh, that big announcement back in July, and it's been uh, much debated here and other uh, places. Uh, the province in for eighty million dollars of capital. Uh, the uh, hundred million dollar uh, financing to be paid uh, mainly by the users through a seat tax. Uh, the riders uh, twenty five million uh, plus upgrades, and the city of Regina seventy three million. Uh, what is, to your awareness now, uh, the construction schedule or the the rollout of the timing on this? Well, the planning work uh, needs to get completed and soon uh, on exactly what the new uh, roof ready roof ready stadium would look like, uh, so that construction can begin. I think people obviously want to see shovels in the ground in the in the spring, uh, and uh, and the planning work wrapped up by then. Uh, you know, uh, we've had some feedback from around the province on this, and people have concerns whenever public dollars are spent. But I'm I'm pleased to say, John, I think the. Uh, uh, that uh, the the response has been very reasonable. I mean, people understand that governments have in the past helped to about 30 percent in terms of a grant to help to build a lot of arenas and rinks in rural and urban Saskatchewan um, uh, that uh, would not have happened if government had decided, look, not to spend any money on sporting facilities until every road that needed to be fixed was done and every school was built because we would just simply never get to those piece, those uh, projects. And quality of life is part of the Saskatchewan advantage. We want to be able to offer the entire package. Uh, so I also think there's been appreciation increasingly, too, of the fact that the stadium will be uh, for amateur sport as well and not just the riders. And we've got four years to uh, spread out that $80 million investment and a, loan guarant- and, a, and a loan that, of course, as you've mentioned, will be paid back by users. So I think the right balance is struck there. And um, uh, I think uh, when planning is done, hopefully very soon here, we'll, uh, we'll be, uh, it'll be construction ready. Now, what is your sense? I mean, you are pretty tapped into public opinion. Uh, you know, we, we tend to see uh, the, uh, the staunch fiscal conservative wants zero government dollars. Uh, the staunch member of the left wants zero development. Uh, in the middle, you've got the people who say, well, it should only have a roof on it. So you kind of have those three different constituencies. But overall, uh, what would you gauge support to be like for this specific proposal? Well, you put your finger on the politics of this thing. I mean, governments, uh, we didn't make this decision to uh, uh, to win seats or win an election because you, you, you're right when you point out that even those in favor of a stadium development are split. They're going to be split on location. They're going to be split on, well, we should have put a lid on it if we're doing it at all. Uh, and then some, will, be, uh, some will, will take exception with the level of public dollars, if any. Those who are opposed to it are, you know, they're pretty much... Uh, uh, there's consensus, there's unanimity there. Uh, and so this is not about politics. This is about, I get, you know, we've made a decision to get a project done we think is very important for the province. Uh, you know, uh, at some point uh, years ago, they made decisions uh, with respect to Taylor Field that I think served the province very well, and I hope this is how this is viewed in the, in the future. But uh, this, isn't, uh, this isn't about a sort of a political calculation because... Uh, the numbers there, for the reasons I've mentioned, they, they just don't work out. But overall, I do think the, re- the response has been, uh, frankly, uh, better than I thought it, would, it might be because of the split and even in, uh, amongst those who support it. And uh, we're moving forward. Premier Brad Wall with us. This is Ask the Premier Ian in Delisle, Saskatchewan. You're on with Premier Wall. Uh, hi, Premier Wall. Um, hate to uh, hit you with another highways question, but uh, I'm going to anyway. Um, we uh, live along uh, Highway 45, which uh, goes from Delisle to uh, Outlook. Uh, now, there's quite a stretch of that highway that's uh, very narrow and needs to be repaired, and it actually was on the list to be repaired, apparently, when the uh, NDP was in, I guess. And um, we, uh, we had purchased a, uh, a yard site there that uh, has the um, raw materials uh, stockpiled on it, 
Um, we purchased that last year. And uh, I'm just wondering, uh, from what I've been able to gather from the Department of Highways, um, the majority of the uh, right-of-ways have all been purchased. And uh, like I say, we have all the, um, the bed material there for the highway. And uh, from the sounds of it, it's basically half paid for. And uh, just wondering um, if that's in the queue to get done or, or if it's going to get done anytime soon or not. Ian, thanks very much for the call. I will check specifically into that uh, highway. There are a lot of highways uh, that need uh, the attention of government. We have, uh, for the last five budgets now, put a record amount into highways, and we understand uh, with clarity that uh, there's just so much more work that needs to be done. Uh, and so uh, we're going to continue to to, rec- to invest those record amounts and try to catch up on what was a very significant infrastructure deficit going forward. Uh, the call, Ian might remember that uh, our government early on changed the the list process uh, in terms of which projects were up next to be much more transparent and available over five years. This was not the case under the previous government, and so without being too partisan, I can tell you that uh, almost every highway uh, was on the list to get done. Uh, but uh, being on the list and getting done were seemingly two different things. But we do know there's we have to there's so much more work that needs to be done, John. And uh, we'll check specifically into 45. Premier Brad Wall with us uh, now to the text at 306 306. Uh, any talk, uh, Premier, between the government and the Saskatchewan Association of Rural Municipalities on consolidating RMs? That's the question from Norman Wyston. Uh, Norm, thanks for the, uh, the question through Twitter, you know, or uh, through the text. Um, we've had a general discussion, both with RM leaders, I think, and ministers, with MLAs, uh, with myself and the, and the president of SARM, about, uh, uh, about the possibility of incentives. Uh, in other words, not a stick, but a, but a carrot for these kinds of things. It hasn't gone much beyond that. Um, we do believe that this has to, be, has to be something that comes from the municipal sector uh, and not... Uh, from some central planning unit in Regina, because uh, uh, not a lot of good happens when that when that occurs. Uh, so it's something that we're open to, but we do think it has to be brought about because municipalities themselves have identified the importance of it. And it's increasingly important around our major centers. I mean, that also is well documented uh, around Saskatoon. Uh, and so I think you'd have a government here who would be we're very willing to listen uh, to those who are uh, who are, might propose ways to achieve this through uh, through incentives. Uh, uh, that government might be able to provide to uh, municipalities. Premier Brad Wall is here. This is Ask the Premier when we get back. The Quebec election is underway, and that's always an interesting time for Canadians, especially those of us who like the idea of a united Canada. Questions to the Premier next on that, and more on the pr- province's finances. I'm John Gormley, one 332 8255 This is News Talk Radio. John Gormley, this is Ask the Premier, our regular monthly session on the radio, where Premier Brad Wall uh, takes your calls, takes your questions, and I'll tell you, between uh, Facebook, Twitter, texting, emailing, no shortage of queries for the Premier. 1-877-332-8255 if you want to join us on the phones to put your questions to Premier Wall. Uh, Premier, a text from Patrick uh, Mr. Premier, will the province introduce veteran plates for motorcycles? Uh, I believe Alberta, Ontario, Quebec, and B.C. have done so. Afghanistan has produced many young vets who ride. Your thoughts on that? Patrick, thanks very much for that text. Uh, I do not know the answer to that. Obviously, we have veterans' plates for, uh, for light vehicles, um, cars and trucks. But I don't know if we do for, for motorcycles. And if we don't, then I'm announcing on John Gormley Live today that we will. Uh, I think it is a... It's a good idea. We've tried to uh, do some other things to honor veterans, especially those who of the more recent conflicts, i.e. Afghanistan. We have a scholarship of honor in place that uh, we introduced shortly after the election to provide a scholarship for the family members or the actual returning vet uh, to go to do some post-secondary school. We recently dedicated the, the uh, our own uh, Highway of Heroes between Moose Jaw and Regina, and I like the idea of, uh, of motorcycle plates. So if we don't have it now, we will have it. Good. Well, thank you, Premier. Done and done. Patrick, great question. Uh, other question, uh, as we start to look at the larger national issues, uh, you just got back and we, we started the show today with some reflections on the Premier's meeting. 
Uh, we're into a Quebec election, voting day, September the 4th. And the one thing about Quebec elections is they, uh, uh, with a couple of parties crowding on the separatist side, uh, Jean Charest's liberals looking for a fourth term, there's always some interesting politics on the future of Canada. How do you see this election for Premier Charest? Well, it's obviously a very important election. He's got uh, basically separatists uh, are on, on either side of the equation. He's got two opposition parties uh, proposing the biggest challenge, and both would advocate separatism. They don't talk about it much anymore, but at their core, they'd be, uh, they'd be separatists. And so I think the whole country will be watching very carefully as to, to see what happens in this particular election campaign. It's tough to win four, four terms, period. Uh, you know, never mind uh, in, I think, what is a very... Uh, 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 you know, well, not unlike Saskatchewan, but a, a fairly, uh, uh, I, I would say, amplified political environment that exists in the province of Quebec. So we'll all be watching it very carefully. It's also important to us from the from the perspective of transfers. Uh, we're coming into a time to a season where the provinces, where the federal government's looking at the uh, the renewal of the equalization formula. We have, in the case of Quebec a province that gets about $7.4 billion in equalization, the largest amount. Uh, this may feature in the campaign as well. That's obviously pretty important to all of the rest of the provinces, including the half provinces of which Saskatchewan's won. So, you know, I think there will be a number of issues the rest of the country will be watching carefully. Premier Brad Wall, uh, on the question of Saskatchewan as a half province and the equalization, uh, a piece last week, uh, former Bank of Co- Canada Governor David Dodge and uh, two other academics, on the future of equalization, the general consensus being that unless things change, there could be some pressures uh, even on Canadian unity. How do you see the future of the existing equalization program? John, the principle of equalization uh, in this country has always been that because of the payments that come from the federal government to quote-unquote have-not provinces, those provinces then can offer programs and services at a comparable level that you'd get anywhere else. And we can argue about the merits of that program versus the merits of a maybe a new national structure that would say, well, but if there are opportunities in one part of the country, then maybe relocation is necessary so provinces aren't recruiting all over the world for people. But even if even setting that aside... Uh, if, for example, the programs and services in the recipient provinces are actually greater than, are more significant than they are in the have provinces, you're going to have have provinces with concerns. You know, Quebec's tuition is the second lowest in the country, even after the increase that brought all the kids out, students out onto the street. Uh, and uh, there's also the, the you know the very low cost daycare that's available there. There's other things that different provinces do that some may argue, well, that, that's really not about equality. Uh, but about an advantage, and uh, really, that's not the intent of those equalization payments. I think that's uh, sort of where Mr. Dodge and the others were going in their article, but that's going to be part of the discussion, and I think it's a fair part. It should be part of the discussion. So even, and let me push you a little on this, I mean, there is a principle enshrined in the Constitution that simply talks about some balancing. You know, nobody uses the words equalization formula in the Constitution. So how big a change does this program need? Well, I, I think that everything should be on the table. We had a general discussion the premiers did at the most recent meeting uh, in Halifax, and uh, the formula is Byzantine. It's very complicated. It's, it's dated, um, and I think it's reasonable to have everything on the table. Uh, we understand, as a, as a province that used to receive, and by the way, our intent is to never be in that position again, but as a province that used to receive, I think we can be an honest broker in this because uh, we know the importance of having as a province of having that help from the rest of Canada. We also know uh, how uh, much I think everybody's enjoying contributing to the rest of Canada. And, and so the, the principle itself is not something that we would object to. But when you take a look at the numbers and where most of the money is going, I think there's some questions that should be asked. And in a general way, I'll just say, John, I think everything should be on the table. Mr. Premier, uh, always good having you by. Thank you for taking uh, this hour out of your time today, and uh, we'll see you next month. Thanks, John. Take care.